So welcome everybody. Welcome to our University of Adelaide Ecology and Evolutionary Series seminars. Welcome to our final spring session in um, this spring session on environmental diversity. So we started off in the ocean with marine diversity and we've come all the way through and today we've got a bit of a focus um, to close the session looking at the fungal kingdom um, and diversity within our fungal kingdoms. But we have two great speakers um, today focusing around these themes around curious, cutting edge and community. So we're a handful of researchers who donate our time to run this seminar series. And we do that because we're wanting to create an inclusive community that educates, engages, and energizes our environmental science community um, here and also internationally. So we have people joining us um, from all around the world. So welcome to everybody, wherever you're Zooming in from. It's fantastic. We love that um, Zoom makes it possible for us to all get together in this space. Now, Matt Bowie and I have been co-hosting this um, series since April, and we're really excited to share that our team is growing um, because we've had so much demand of people wanting to speak and, and people wanting to join us. So a growing list of people that are Zooming in um, and also watching online. So we've needed to grow the team. So thank you to everybody who responded with great ideas about how to do that. And to um, those of you that have put up your hand to join us. So we can share that we have four more team members um, and they're with us today. So Asha Girl, Celeste, Jenny and Wendy. So thank you to the four of you for um, joining Matt and I as part of our seminar team and always really keen to have um, other people joining us as well. So thank you. Before we head on into the speakers, um, just a reminder for people to please, um, as you are, to, um, just mute. So keep your mics muted um, so that um, it doesn't interrupt the flow of um, the speakers. And we, we um, keep the footage on our speakers who will be spotlighted. Okay. So then I want to um, introduce so I introduce our first speaker, um, Jenny Weinheimer, who is a master's candidate here at University of Adelaide. And um, Jenny is under the supervision of um, Bertram Ostendorf. And Jenny is focusing on the theme around conservation funding. So you can see her here with her brush tail possum Jabuki. And we're hoping that maybe Jabuki might make a, um, a bit of a, an appearance later if we're lucky in the question time. So um, Jenny, thanks so much for joining us and we will hand over to you. So yeah, so before we start, I'd love it if we could do an exercise together. So if you feel comfortable too, I'd love it if we could just close our eyes and imagine that you are on your shopping trip for the week, the coming week, and you're choosing out all the best foods, vegetables, meats, and breads. You've filled your trolley with everything you want to eat for the coming week, and then you're going to the checkout. At the checkout, you pull out your wallet. There's no cash in there, so you pull out your card. You swipe it, and then you find out it comes back declined. I think that's a bit weird, so you Furiously logging on to your online banking, looking to see what's going on. And in your bank account, you see you have only one fifth of the money that you thought you did. Now go ahead and open your eyes. This is actually the reality that our conservation sector is facing as far as our funding. We only have one fifth of the funding that we actually need. And we'll get into those actual figures in a little bit. I do want to acknowledge the country that I am on and the traditional owners of the Ghana land on which I am presenting, where I study and where I live, and want to pay my respects to the elders past, present, and future of the Ghana people. So today I'm going to be covering, we'll have five basic parts of this. We're going to do a quick blitz on who I am, why we should care about conservation funding. We'll go on a whirlwind tour of the conservation funding literature. And then I'll discuss my research proposal and we'll get to see a few early results as well. So who am I? I'm Jenny Weinheimer. You can see my little pet possum as well. Uh, I was born in Provo, Utah. So that is this part of the United States. 
And then I grew, uh oh, I have pictures too, I forgot about that. <laughs> so this is the mountainous area. Then I moved over to Colorado, the wetter side of the mountains, so a little bit prettier. Then I was over, spent most of my growing up years over in Maryland, that's near DC as well. So it's a lot more trees there. And then I spent a brief amount of time in New York and a brief amount of time in Texas before I ended up back in Utah. I started, I did my first degree there, a bachelor's in linguistics, <clears throat> and I graduated in 2007. And then in 2011, I met a man online and I got on a plane to Australia, having never met him in person. We got married 19 days later in New Zealand, we eloped. And 10 years later, it is the best decision that I've ever made. I went back to university in 2016 and studied wildlife conservation biology and just graduated that in 2019. It was sitting in my conservation biology course in 2019 that I really started to think on this topic of conservation funding and how it felt like the elephant in the room that we don't have enough money and we need to be addressing this. Otherwise, all of the great science that people like say, people like Pam and all the other you know, scientists who we see present in these series, how are they gonna get the money to do that work and do this conservation work, learn more about these things if we don't have enough money to do so. So that's the first thing about why we should care about conservation funding. But I mean, if these, if these cute little faces are not enough reason, aren't they so cute? Then the other concern to me is that we're in a sixth mass extinction event. There's not consensus that we are, but there is emerging concern from experts that we may be in a sixth mass extinction event. And this is the first event that would have been caused by the actions of a single species, us as humans. And going beyond what the literature says, I guess on an existential level as a human, I'm concerned when I look at, okay, we see dinosaurs, they disappeared, trilobites, they disappeared. These were organisms that were very successful and very common across the earth. So to me, I think we don't know what will happen if we actually cause a mass extinction event. Will we actually survive? That's something I worry about. That's not the most scientific, but it is something that drives me is that concern. Now, looking at our funding, this um, diagram that I've created, I've done based on three papers, three wonderful papers. We don't actually have any paper that looks at the global whole of how much conservation funding do we need for biodiversity in general, but we get pretty close if we put these two papers together. So this is a McCarthy paper from 2012 and Baldford's paper from 2004, because one looked at the terrestrial side, one looks at the marine side, and they estimate together that it would be about $100 billion a year that we need to cover 20 to 30% of the oceans in marine protected areas, and that we would need uh, about uh, and to protect all of the terrestrial species, to have enough protected areas to cover our terrestrial species as well. The good news to me is that our actual funding is only, it's one fifth of this, this is not nearly enough, we need to increase it dramatically, but we're not talking about that we need to increase it by a thousand times or 10,000 times. If we increase it by five times, we're gonna be in a really good position. This estimate comes from Waldron et al. We'll get to this paper in just a moment because there's lots of other great things in this paper. But they estimated back in 2013 that our global spend on conservation is around $22 billion a year. It's not enough. We need to increase it. We need to get that. But to me, this is an achievable target, $100 billion a year compared to everything else that we spend money on should be something that we can do. 
So let's jump right into the literature. I uh, have had a lot of joy reading all of the great work that people are doing in this area. And so it's really great to be able to share that with you. So the first paper I'm gonna share with you is this Waldron et al paper. This funny little stories. I actually found this paper on my birthday. And so <laughs> I found this paper and it was like, oh, it opened my eyes. And I was like, oh, cause this is kind of what I thought maybe my research might end up being. It was very early on, but then I found this paper and I said, oh, they've already done this, this is great. And so I, I, I said, oh, happy birthday to me from Waldron et al when I found this paper. It's called Targeting Global Conservation Funding to Limit Immediate Biodiversity Declines. And the way that they've actually structured this paper is so we'll see two maps here. So this first map is how they have determined the global biodiversity fraction. So the way that works is they've taken all of the mammals across the world. And so in each country, so let's say for example, in Australia, we have a very poor mammal record as it's probably well known, but so that's why, so red is the worst, just so that makes sense. The measure works to show how threatened your estate is for mammals. They've done mammals because they're fairly well researched. So I think that's why they selected mammals. So they use that to say how basically how threatened are your species. So we are among the worst in this in this area. And then they've actually generated a model. And this is looking at the status quo in essence. So compared to every other country and what they are spending, how do you fall in? That's what the model uh, fault like, that's what the model does. So it looks at funding levels, it looks at your GDP. So even if you have a really bad uh, threat level, if you don't have as much money, there isn't as much expectation that you're going to be able to confront that. And so we can see while Australia is not the worst here, we are in the second worst. So darker is worse here. So this is this darkest color is the worst. And then we're kind of in the second worst group. Another great paper that actually looks specifically at Australia, just gotta grab a little bit of water here, is, is Wintel et al. 2019 uh, called Spending to Save. This estimates that Australia's current spending on conservation while on threatened species is $122 million a year Australian. And they've estimated that this is only 15% of what is needed. So if we look at the globe as a whole, we're about 20% of what we need. So we are still below that. We would need $820 million a year to avoid extinctions and recover threatened species. The limitations with the paper that they've done is that to estimate recovery, they've esti taken the costs that it's taken in the United States to recover species. And so obviously that's not necessarily comparable and that presents some issues. But because we have not actually successfully recovered species here in Australia, they worked with what they had. And then to look at the United States. So I just, ha I have a table here for us to look at. We can see lots of, there's actually a, quite a bit of literature that actually addresses conservation funding within the United States. But the main thing I wanna point out here is looking at the time spans of these articles. We're generally looking at one to two decades and you know maybe one year. There's this paper by Gerber. Gerber, this is a great paper. If you were gonna read one paper, besides Walter et al. I would recommend this paper. Very, very good paper. Um, but, and that one goes 34 years. But the, the big gap that I saw when I looked at this is we don't have a long-term perspective. The issues that have created the current biodiversity crisis that we are in have not been created over a decade or two. They've been created over centuries. And so looking at just these really short-term funding isn't gonna give us the full picture that we need. So my research proposes to look at a longer term. I've selected the United States for a couple of reasons. The first is if we're looking at a long term, we want something where we think 
there has been conservation funding in some degree for a long period of time. So the United States had their first national park start in 1872 with Yellowstone. Didn't actually get any funding until 1877, five years later, but it did get funding as starting 1877. They also have uh, open and accessible historical budgets. And we also have the benefit that nonprofits in the United States are required to disclose their revenue data every year. So we can at least build up a picture of what's happening in the private sector over at least the past couple uh, couple decades, if not longer, depending on what I'm able to get from other records. So the research questions that I'm looking at are how has conservation funding changed through time in the United States? How do growth, stagnation, and decreases in conservation change through time in the different sectors? in the federal, the private, and also the state uh, government funding. But I also think obviously a, a $19.20 is not the same as a $20.20. $20, so we need to be able to relate, be able to compare apples to apples across a long period of time. So I'm going to relate this to overall government spending to see how much does conservation spending relate to overall spending by the government and also relate it to overall changes in the GDP with the aim to improve the understanding of how do we get dramatic changes in conservation resourcing. How has that occurred in the past? With obviously the aim to in the future understanding how might we in increase, have dramatic increases into the future. So to do that, I'll do that by tracking yearly conservation spending from the late 1800s into the present in the three areas that we've talked about. And then to consolidate this data set and identify periods of relative stability, along with periods of significant change. That's my hypothesis is that there would be periods of significant change, um, either an increase or decrease and across the three different areas, but I, I believe it'll probably be different. And then once I've identified those periods of significant change, then I wanna go back and just look and see what's actually caused that change at that particular time. The ideal will be to really dig into that, but that's not quite in the scope of the master's project. So for the master's project, it will be just identify the period and then see, okay, was there legislation passed? Um, you know, what actually, who actually made the decision to make that increase in funding happen? So I have a few results to share with you about what I've found so far. So the first thing that I had to, because I'm relating everything to overall government spending, the first thing that I have to track is how much government spend is there. So this is all at the federal level. This is the only data I've been able to collect so far because um, I'm very early on in my project. Uh, so this is do total government expenditure. Um, interesting things to point out here. You see this little bump over the war period. So World War II, you can see where the US entered, there were big increases in expenditure. But you can see this overall trend. Part of this is gonna be related to GDP that we see increases in government expenditure over time. But we also see increases, the government, the share of the government of the US economy has increased over time as well which isn't shown in this graph, but that is part of the reason that we see this huge increase. So the two, I'm doing my collection based on agencies. So the two main agencies in the United States that do conservation work are the National Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service. So the National Park Service, my data set that I've collected so far goes from 1921 to 1995. And the type of increases, if, if this was, uh, on my final data set, I'd be very interested to see why we've had this huge jump. This jump in this case actually is just because the National Park Service took on responsibilities that were previously assigned to a different agency, which will also be a part of my data set. So when all of that data is consolidated, this huge jump will disappear. But those are the sort of things I'll be looking for is, okay, where do we see these huge jumps? And then looking back, okay, why did that happen? What caused it? 
and we see the and I'm collecting on the Fish and Wildlife Service as well to see what we can collect through there. And so you can see this, you know, period of the 70s, there's a big increase there. Is it because the once that's related to the GDP and the overall government spending, it'll be easier to tell to tease out to see, okay, is that actually a, a real increase in conservation spending or is that just kind of moving on with the status quo of everything going up at that point. Now I've also been collecting on the Forest Service, something that produces commercial goods and more for that. It's as a basis of comparison, it's a good comparison because it's based on something that's a natural resource, but they're not managed for conservation the forest, they are managed for resource to be for extractive reasons. And so the thing that you probably have probably weren't looking on this side to see what so, how big were our scale. So this is 4 billion here. But to put in perspective, so if we just compare our last two to the Forest Service, I'll put them onto a 4 billion scale. And you can see well, they're a lot less now. So even putting these two together in 1995, they're both around 1.5 billion. But that only puts them up to about 3 billion compared to our forest service. I would only put it up to around here as of 1995. So we're getting a lot less money into the conservation sector than into the forest service is what that shows. And that is basically, that's what I've been able to collect so far. But for me, the significance of this research, it would be relevant to conservation managers, managers for understanding the whole historical context of what has worked in the past particularly at the higher levels, people who have to work with politicians, because this is at the interaction between conservation and politics. So it would also be relevant to conservation minded politicians to understand what periods of time have seen those increases. So they may be able to understand why they've been able to successfully increase conservation funding in the past. And then of course, it's relevant to any researchers in conservation funding in providing that context and longer time scale for their shorter term papers that they might be doing. And most of all, hopefully, if we can get the funding that we need, it'll be relevant to these beautiful animals because they definitely need us. So if you have anything I'm really passionate about this area. And I think we really need to understand. I obviously can't do this on my own. So if you have any ideas, if you think, oh, I've always thought that, cons or if you, if this has brought up thoughts in your mind that maybe conservation funding could be related to this, maybe we could increase it in this way. I wonder if it would be related to that. I would love to hear your thoughts. So feel free to obviously drop them in the chat or ask them as a question now, but otherwise just contact me on my email I would love to chat with you one on one when we have a bit more time to do so as well. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Jenny. So we've got time for questions from the audience. If you would like to ask Jenny either directly, you can unmute yourself and ask, or you can type it into the chat box at the bottom as well and ask that way. So are there any questions from the audience straight away? And here's Jabrookie. He loves his roses. Oh, he's <laughs> he's oh. he's scared. <laughs> he's not gonna stay. No, he's not gonna stay. It's okay. Come here. Come here. He's scared. There is one question in the chat there from Celeste. You get his bum. Okay. What was okay? Yeah, it's okay. Uh, yeah. So I am looking at um, I'm looking at the top twenty. I think he's not gonna. Um, so I am looking at the top 20 charities in the United States that deal with conservation funding, like that deal with conservation that's specifically done in the United States. So uh, that, that's my selection criteria. So I'm having trouble with trying to decide what I should do with like the WWF and uh, the Nature Conservancy since they receive so much money in the United States, but they don't necessarily spend most of their funds in the United States. So it's not necessarily comparable to uh, federal, federal funding, but I am looking 
at that. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm looking to track that. I've actually, so I've contacted, I've contacted 20, I've heard back from two. Uh, so I have 20 years of data, but I'm looking to get as much data as I can to go back even further. So. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Any other questions? I've got one, if everyone's still too shy. Um, what would be the significance of the changing role of who's providing that funding for conservation through time versus like governments and NGOs and private sector? Yeah, so that's an interesting, like, so that's, I, I don't know exactly how to answer your question, but I do, I, I think it's an interesting question, uh, because that's, a, that's the thing that's interesting in tracking the revenues of NGOs, I can see that the issue that I'm seeing is that sometimes the primary source of revenues for non-governmental organizations is actually still originating from the government as well. So it'll be really hard to actually disentangle that information to figure out how much money is actually coming from private philanthropy from you know donations of private donors and how much is actually them getting money from the government. So it, it's, it's a com it is a complicated issue. I don't have a direct answer on how you actually deal with that. Uh, that's part of what I'll be doing, I guess, over, <laughs> over the next period of time is figuring out how to, how to work with that. And as Jenny said, she's at the start of her master's journey. So you can contact her there. I will get when you finish up, Jenny, just type your email in the chat so people can yeah. get that down. Um, but yeah, really good to see your passion for this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Bowie. And um, thank you again, Jenny. Fantastic. Okay. So we move on now to our. Um, Second guest, our special guest, Pam Catcherside. So Pam is an honorary research associate from our state herbarium here in South Australia. And Pam has been studying the larger fungi of South Australia for more than 20 years and has only recently handed over the reins um, from being the convener of the Adelaide Fungal Studies Group after leading that for 19 years. 19 years. So so when I was thinking um, about how to introduce Pam, because I've had the absolute pleasure of knowing Pam for many years and um, I guess being mentored by her in this space. And I thought, how do, how do I introduce Pam? And I thought, well, I think for me, I, I wonder if we could call Pam the Jane Goodall of Australia's ASCO fungal world. So if you're not sure what an ASCO is, Pam talks about them as being little black blobs. Oh, blobs. <laughs> yes. They're not always black, of course. And so Pam will be talking about some of her blobs. And I think of, of Pam as being a bit of a Jane Goodall um, for the fungal world because she's an esteemed scientist with such an enormous wealth of knowledge, her gentle wisdom and wonderful stories. If you haven't been in the field with Pam yet, I highly, highly recommend it because of all the stories and the connections that she shares in sharing that knowledge. And through that, Pam really does make the mysterious world of fungi accessible and inspiring to so many people and helps so many people discover that. So without further ado, I'll hand over to our special guest, Pam Catcherside. Thank you very much indeed, Jasmine. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me too to talk about the fungi. Um, I'm going to be talking about fungi, whoopsie daisies, let's go back to that one. Um, and looking at the fungi, most of a fungus is underground. And here you can see the roots and these white bits of fungal socks really. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but we've got the fungi in very close association with, with the plant roots above ground ones here. And fungi didn't do this on their own, transforming a part of burnt land back in 2008, uh, after the 2007 fires into this, it's the same, same spot, but you can see that that has changed enormously. 
And what I'm going to be covering today is um, the range of fungi. Look, I'll be looking at the diversity of form, ecology, roles, that is what they do. Very briefly, fungal evolution, and then go on to how we make use of fungi and potential future uses, because we really could tap into their strengths and their beauty and their strangeness. And here we've got a shelf, beautiful fans, a little pagoda fungus, my disc fungi that uh, Jasmine's talked about, truffles here, which Tracer works on, and these fluffy things here on a cicada, a parasitic on that. And then behind here, we've got, I uh, can't see it actually, but we've got bird's nest fungus here. Um, the fungi evolved, you can see here that uh, the fungi were fairly late in evolution and they branched off at about the same time as the animals. In fact, fungi have got far more in uh, common with uh, animals than they have with plants. Of course, uh, we know that these uh, tawny frog mouths are not going to photosynthesize as plants do. The plants, of course, make, make food, they make sugars, and the sugars can be of use to the fungi. Sometimes there are very close relationships between the two. So looking at the numbers of fungi, huge numbers, they're estimated to take up about 10 to 15 percent of all organisms on Earth. Approximately 3.8 million species of fungi worldwide with only, and this is uh, because there aren't too many people daft enough to work on fungi, though they're wonderful things, um, only 5 to 10 percent are described. Uh, one estimate of the number of fungi, however, got, got them up to 5.6 million. So we really don't know there's a lot of tapping of underground that has been going on. In Australia, it's reckoned that there are about a quarter of a million species of fungi, but that includes the microfungi, and I'm not going to be covering those uh, in, at all really this afternoon. I work on, as Jasmine said, on the larger fungi. And of the larger fungi, the basidios, and I'm afraid I haven't got time to go into uh, the difference between the ascos that uh, Jasmine mentioned and the basidios, but the basidios encompass mushrooms, brackets, clubs, jelly, truffles, or, no, not all truffles. Um, so about 10 to, uh, 10 to 12,000 estimated numbers and only about 4,000 described. So a very long way to go. Looking at the diversity of size, we can see here that the smallest are, uh, fungi are amongst the yeasts. That is only about two hundredths of a millimeter across from there to there. And on the other side of the scale, we've got this fungus, obviously not just one cap taking up 10 square kilometers, but the whole, um, the whole body of that fungus, which makes up lots and lots of fruit bodies, is, is estimated to occupy about 10 square kilometers. And it's estimated too to be more than 2,400 years old. That um, is from Oregon and it's, the, um, it's one whole organism. Then we have an enormous variety of what they grow on. Um, here I've only got land hab habitats, but we've got uh, some lovely little ones, little fans on wood, on mulch. Uh, we've got uh, the amanitas here on soil. We've got this parasitic uh, fungus here, which is on a grasshopper, and we can actually make use of that, and I'll explain a little bit about that later. Dung isn't something we want to be accumulating too much of, and here you can see a fungus which is doing a bit of breaking down of that. And another fungus which we've made use of is this rust fungus, which is on bridal creeper, and that's breaking, uh, well, not breaking down so much, but uh, just on the photosynthetic area. And after a time, it kills the host. So as we don't want bridal creeper, that's a good thing. Uh, looking at the diversity of form, we've got the mushrooms, other guild fungi, we've got earth balls here, we've got these lovely puff balls, puff balls with the center with the earth stars, we've got uh, coral fungi, these thick brackets, we've got thin brackets, uh, we've got uh, jelly fungi, and we've got some others, which I, oh, there's a paint fungus behind there, and I think there's a disc fungus, sorry, I can't get rid of people. Uh, so don't, that's awfully rude, no, I don't mean that at all. Um, so we've got a great variety of fungi. Um, then spores, I love looking at spores, and you can see some have got tails, and they're very tiny. Uh, we've got some which are round, some which are spiny, some which are angled, some which are 
elongated, some which look like little loaves. This one is absolutely huge and I was thrilled bits to find that. Had to contact Tom and Teresa at about 11 o'clock at night to say, look what I've found, more round ones. Some of these fungi have got black, blackened covers, which means that they're more able to withstand the high um, uh, 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 temperatures. They also uh, grow in lots and lots of places on all um, land surfaces and in aquatic environments from polar regions to the tropics in snow melts, lots of exciting ones in snow melts, including some of the slime molds. Fire sites, I work on the fire sites, rather devastating place to work, but some very interesting fungi. Desert fungi are fun, tundra too, and they grow in fresh water, in seawater. Even they've been found at, at ocean depths of 10,000 meters in the Mariana tre Trench. But I'm briefly going to go to one side and look at the, their evolution. They're thought to have evolved around 1,500 1, million years ago. That's two thirds into the life of the, the Earth. We haven't got much in the fossil record because they decay very quickly. So we are at a disadvantage with them. But in um, uh, Scotland, in the, in the, whoopsie, Davis, so go back to that. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, sorry. Um, where are we? I've uh, gone too fast. Uh, Ah, sorry. Um, oh dear, oh dear. I get overexcited with the wretched things. Here we are. Sorry, back with the evolution. Um, I press the, the buzz, I think. Um, we've got the Rhiney Church, and here you can see an illustration. And in the swollen base of the st stick-like uh, plant, uh, you can just about see, I think, the dark bits of the fungus. And in this section of the stem, you can see dark sections of, of fungus there. And this huge fungus, you can see the size of it in co uh, comparison with the, the man standing there. Um, that's Prototaxites, which was found in Canada and Saudi Arabia, estimated to be about 40 million years old, and reconstruction on the other side. Um, this um, paper came out uh, last year. I was fortunate enough to be able to provide some about 150 specimens for this project. Uh, its grand name is the Megaphylogeny Resolves Global Patterns of Mushroom diversi Diversification. But one of the paraphrases which I rather cared for was how the mushroom got its hat. And it really looks at how fungi went from this primitive sort, the jelly sorts of fungi, this sort of thing, to the fungi which have got their hats and you're all around the edge. And I do recommend that paper. It's, it's quite deep, but it's fascinating. Um, it goes into how the, how the mushroom got its hat. And the project that I've been working on with David, my husband and others, about 10 of us having a good time collecting, we've, um, we're trying to find out how the mushroom became a truffle. And if you're above ground, it um, can be pretty hot and dry, not very nice. So going underground is a good idea. And we're, we've got 12 pairs of mushrooms. We've got only three pairs here. Uh, this is the mushroom one going underground, another mushroom one going underground, another one mushroom going underground. And that's happened many, many times uh, amongst the fungi. So lots of, and lots of different sorts of mushrooms have gone underground very sensibly, especially in climate change. Looking at the roles of fungi in the environment, some are saprotrophs, mycorrhizal parasites, the helpers, naughty ones like parasites and pathogens, and fungal endophytes, which are really quite exciting. Looking at the um, roles of them, this one is, these are saprotrophs. They break down the organic matter on which they're growing, in this case, wood and wood here and dung there, and more wood there, and more wood there, and animal um, tissue there. And they break that down, recycle it for the uh, making in the soil for the benefit of plants and all the organisms which are dependent on the complex soils. Um, they're also helpers, very important mycorrhizal partners of, of plants. Um, here again, you can see the roots and the socks. And here's the tree, obviously. The, uh, if a section is taken through the root, you can see here these uh, root cells. And this dark tissue here is uh, the fungal tissue. And up comes the, the mushroom from time to time. And here, this lovely photograph of um, a little sapling of a pine. And you can see the roots underneath. 
uh, encompassing or enveloped by the, uh, the, the fungi. And they go, uh, those fungal hyphae go out, you can see so much more, so much further than the root system itself. So that means that the plant doesn't have to put, put nearly as much root down. A few examples of different mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, fungal endophytes, um, these have been discovered not all that long ago, about 100 years or so ago. Uh, they, uh, an endophyte is something which lives within a, within a plant for at least part of its life without causing any apparent disease. It can be a bacterium or a fungus and occur, probably occurs in all plants, in roots, stems, leaves, and it confers beneficial effects on the hosts, including helping them to tolerate heavy metals which is helpful, obviously, um, helping them to resist disease, helping them to produce toxins, which make them unpalatable for insects, helping them to combat drought and salinity. And one which we've been working on a bit, to, uh, uh, one of David's students, oops, see back, um, back with them, um, uh, is this, um, this disc fungus here, uh, Anthracobia moralabra, and it's um, thought to be endophytic within the root base, sorry, the leaf bases of, of Xanthorrhea. Um, some of the negatives are parasites like this Armillaria, which is a Northern Hemisphere species. It's the, uh, it causes the death of trees. This was a pathogen, powdery mildew on our zucchini, which we weren't too happy about. Um, some of the work with David and I have done is on Kangaroo Island. We've got a number of sites on Kangaroo Island, um, six of them which we've, uh, be, we've been surveying in detail in the last um, 12 years or so, but we've been over on Kangaroo Island since 2002. And our sites that we're, we've been concentrating on particularly are four, four sites at Rocky River, this, uh, this site at Ravine de Cassaw, and uh, uh, Kelly Hill Caves, which unfortunately got very badly burnt, like all the rest of this part of the island, back in the summer fires. Um, some of the results, and we've got quite a lot of results, which I'm at present writing up, but uh, I've been looking at the disc fungi, which occur after fire. Uh, they're known as py pyrophilus, that is, they, they like fires, they like heat. And the orange ones show the, these disc fungi, or the disc, fun here's a disc fungus. Uh, these are only come up after fire. They can co uh, cope with the very high um, pH values of soil, which uh, you get um, after fire, can get up to about pH 10. And the disc fungi grow on the soil and take that pH down. And you can see that the disc fungi, and I'm afraid the one that's in the middle is a naughty one. I shouldn't have left that there. That's definitely not a disc fungi, fungus. That one and that one are, but the other, the other isn't. But the disc fungi, as you can see, go down in, in numbers. Um, going on to how they can be made use of, this paper came out last year, uh, written by Kevin Hyde and others, and it looks at fungal diversity. So here's the diversity I've been speaking about briefly. And the diversity feeds into all these different uses to which fungi can be put. It, it says it's looking at 50 ways in which fungi may be used industrially. Obviously, I can't deal with all those in the time, but um, it's really quite exciting what is being done with fungi now. And they've been used for about 6,000 years. Uh, one of the earliest uses was probably by the Egyptians making leavened or risen bread. And what they did once they had the, the emma wheat was to grind the wheat. They uh, baked it partially and left it to ferment by wild yeasts. And they used those wild yeasts for the, the ferment for the bread, so the bread rose. And here we've got a representation of that. Um, the Egyptians were probably the first to make a, an alcoholic drink, probably beer rather than wine. And here's a, a rather nice model of an Egyptian brewery. And again, they, what they used was the sprouted grains of emma wheat and barley, and they used those to cement, uh, to, for, sorry, not to ferment. Made a fairly th thick brew, apparently. Um, we also, as you know, use fungi for food. We've got the button mushroom here, the Boletus edulis, the sep, the porcini, which are now uh, grow in the Adelaide Hills. They popped up 
uh, they've been there for probably for quite some time. The Aborigines, we know, did make, uh, make use and probably still do make use of fungi for food. This great thing here was uh, contacted by a ranger on K Kangaroo Island saying they'd found this huge thing. What was it? And they sent me a photograph and it's a great tuber, an underground tuber, which forms underground after fire and up, up pops the, the mushroom, uh, uh, the sort of mushroom afterwards. It's um, the native bread, Lacocephalum myliti. And Aborigines also use the nat uh, native beach here from Tasmania. Uh, they're also, as I'm sure many of you know, all of you know, they're used in medicines. Um, they're uh, used in antibiotics, immunosuppressants. So anyone who's had a transplant uh, has, would be given immunosuppressants so that they're not, they don't reject that organ. Uh, they can be used to make anti-cancer agents, vaccines, anti-inflammatories, also for lowering, lowering cholesterol. And about 15% of all vaccines and therapeutic proteins are made in yeast. And just a, an aside, Another source of some of these products is a product, products of endophytic fungi, which grow in, in plants, not causing any problems. And one is such as um, taxol, which is obtained from a fungus, which grows uh, endophytically in uh, yew trees. I don't think uh, this one is going to be much used because poor old wallamy pine, I don't think we've got enough of it to make use of it for getting taxol, but quite an interesting aside. Um, in agriculture, I feel that the fungi are very much underutilized in agriculture. We should be making very much more use of them, uh, the mycorrhizal fungi. It's estimated that about 95% of all plants need, rely on uh, their mycorrhizal fungus in order to grow. And no, no tree could get much higher than about two meters without its mycorrhizal fungus. The two main sorts of mycorrhizal fungi, uh, there are the what are called the arbuscular ones, which are here. This is within a root cell. These lovely little tree-like things called arbuscules, which are, form this enormous surface area for exchange, sugars from the plant, nutrients from the, uh, from the fungus. And here, a different sort, where there's a network, a beautiful network over the um, cells of the root. But they are also used not only for mycorrhizal fungi, and as I said, I think there should be many more um, uses of them in this country and other countries, but um, they are a source of fungicides and insecticides. Uh, you can see these poor um, insects, which have not done too well from their uh, fungal partner. They're not really a partner, it's a fungal parasite. Um, and they are killing the, the insect on which they're growing, but a, an extract can be made from one of them called metarhizium, and that is a bioinsecticide which is used to kill locusts and grasshoppers and so on. Um, other important uses, I'll have to rush through these fairly quickly, but for biofuels, here's the little fungus, which uh, trichoderma, which can be used to break down uh, ag agricultural waste, stuff you don't want to make sugars, and that can be make, used to make um, eth ethanol. Bioremediation are used enormously. They can help to degrade toxic waste, such as uranium in the soils. Uh, they can uh, accumulate heavy metals, cesium, arsenic, lead, mercury, and uh, you can then harvest the fungi and get rid of those or you make use of them. You can extract those important uh, heavy metals. Uh, the white rot fungi can degrade uh, compounds in soil and wastewater. They're used in paper manufacture. Um, the, again, this fungus, trichoderma, quite a useful fungus, can um, speed up the paper pulping process. They're used in cotton processing, different, spe different species of uh, aspergillus and also trichoderma used there. And in washing detergents, you might not think that fungi are part of the washing detergent, but they can trim off the cotton fibers, which we get pit from pilling, um, and the, the lipases from the fungi also can break down fats and oils. They can be used to replace plastics. Now, the, we had an earlier talk about plastics and just imagine replacing um, the, uh, the plastics with, uh, with fungal products, biodegradable, uh, biodegradable pro uh, products. And you can use landfill waste to make packaging. That's being done by people in the Adelaide Hills. It can be used to make, make furniture, acoustic pa panels, leather, the leather shoes. And then if you don't like the shoe, you can break it, uh, just um, break it down afterwards. 
But you can make plastics too um, from um, aspergillus species, which make itaconic acid. And that's uh, the um, material from which Lego is made, plastic car parts, synthetic rubber, used in the cosmetic industry, in dyeing too. And um, going on to another use, um, fairly early yet in the building industry, but I was really uh, found this, this slide rather fun. This is a building made of um, bricks. Uh, bricks were made from, the, um, from accumulated waste. Fungi were infiltrated or in, inoculated into them and bricks were made. And this whole edifice was built and you can see the size of it. It's, of course, it's in the Museum of, of Modern Art in Manhattan. And it's being investigated now that um, fungal spores might be able to be inserted into uh, cracks that occur in concrete, and those cracks might be made to heal. And last, um, and quite complex, they're being used more in genome mining. I'll go, uh, this is quite a new thing, but if you want a particular project product, um, you can actually harness fungi. We've now got sequences of uh, over 1,500 fungi. You can take the, the sequence that you want, um, select it, cut it out, and put it into another organism, and that other organism, maybe yeast, can make the product that you want. Very exciting. I think there are a lot of problems that uh, could happen, and I think it needs to be done very carefully. So it, it's a very exciting um, phenomenon, I think. And finally, thank you very much for listening. And I'd like to thank all these people, and mainly my husband, David, who takes all these lovely photographs, and State Herbarium, which gives me a home, and all the other places which give me homes, and the rangers, which help too. And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, sorry, are there any questions? <laughs> So thank you, Pam. And as Pam said, yep, we'll open up if anybody has any questions and we can um, check in the chat line as well there. Can you, can you read that, Pam? So we've got a question here for Pam. You know, uh, are, significant? are there significant differences after fires on Kangaroo Island fungi colonization between the different eucalyptic woodland types? Um, yes, there are. What, which are the quickest to bounce back? I can't really answer from the point of view of the trees. I don't know them well enough. A lot of the work that we do is in Eucalyptus cladocalyx, the sugar, um, uh, sugar uh, uh, trees, um, managums rather, um, stringy barks. Um, there are differences, um, but mostly uh, I think you actually fungi are not that fussy, they, they really are not. Uh, so the disc fungi are going to come up in anywhere where there's a, um, a, a source of, uh, where there's a, a, a spore bank. So it won't matter very much what, what species of eucalypt it is. Mm. The disc fungi will come back, they'll start colonizing the soil and they'll form carpets and mm. stop erosion or help to stop erosion. So there are a lot of different fungi which do come up after fires, but I don't think there's any great difference between the different eucalypt species. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, good question. Another one from Susie. Uh, what method do you use to survey the fungi? Uh, very, uh, very primitive, a, ca a plastic bag, uh, fishing tackle boxes, a knife, a lens. Um, I then dig, go down, I dig down, in the soil to make sure I've got the base of the fungus, put it into a box or cu cover it, keep them all separate because I don't want them to all muddle up amongst themselves, take them back to the lab where I look at them and work out what they are, and then they get dried once I've described them and so on. So it's, it's a, quite a time consuming business. The actual collecting is quite brief. Um, what time? Uh, that is last. So lots of questions coming in. So we'll take um, perhaps one more question and then. Uh, are there any ind indications of species declines? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, we, unfortunately, the fungi have not been uh, sur surveyed as much as uh, plants and certainly not animals. So we really don't know enough about uh, declines of fungi. But the main thing is that 
as habitats decline, as environments decline, as habitats are degraded, and then the fungi are going to follow suit too. Yeah. And Pam, is that an area where um, if there are students joining us and keen to be involved in this space, is, would you suggest that that's one area that would be helpful for them to become involved in? Yes, definitely. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So there are other questions as well um, in the in the chat. Um, Pam may be able to stay on later. Um, I can stay on later. Yes. yes. Okay. Mm. So we mm. might come back mm. to those. Um, but also here, so I've just um, shared the screen again so that we've got Pam's email address there. So if you're interested in getting in touch with Pam, please do. You can email her with questions as well. But yes, if you're able to stay on, Pam's also able to stay for a little bit longer. And uh, we also wanted to share for people who are interested in finding out more about fungal diversity, um, we would highly recommend um, these two ways that you can do that. So I mentioned earlier that Pam had been the convener, convener for 19 years of the Adelaide Fungal Studies Group and Anita, who has taken over the reins as, as convener, um, has given her email address. And my apologies, Anita, I had updated it, but um, this slide doesn't have the updated email. Um, but if you um, would like to email me, I can pass on to Anita, anybody who's interested in, in um, finding out more about fungi through the Fungal Studies Group or through Fungi Map and Fungi Map's iNaturalist project. So you can take good photos of fungi. If you want to know what their name is, put it into iNaturalist and that's a great way to get to learn about some of the fungi that we have in Australia. So thank you again. Thank you to Jenny. Thank you to Chibruki for making a special appearance. Thank you to Pam and- um, Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this session. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. So looking ahead, so we finished our spring season on um, environmental diversity and from next season, so we're heading into summer. So our, our theme for summer is our changing environments. So of course, as we go into summer, we know that it's, uh, we start to get into those really extreme and, and hostile environments and questions about what is that going to be like that? What, what's happening in that space? How is our biodiversity responding to that? And how do we respond to that? So we've got two great speakers with us um, for the first Friday in um, December. So Miriam looking at fossil ecosystems and then Bill looking at the marine um, system and his fascination around uh, marine fisheries and environmental management in that marine space. So Friday, the 4th of December, we um, hope you can join us. But um, until then, um, all the best and we will see you then. Unless you're um, able to stay on and um, Pam is happy to take some more some ideas, questions. But apart from that, yep. As always, please um, send any ideas and feedback. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you for joining us.